Hi, thank you so much for your interest in our research. Before I begin, I want to just disclose that uh, due to some administrative issues, we actually presented at last year's CSW as well. Um, I hope that you'll stay anyway for this updated version of the talk because I think it's even more relevant this year given current events. Okay, so let me get started. I'm Lily Omak and I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm presenting joint work with Ashton Anderson, uh, which is focused on the concept of digital well-being. There's been a lot of attention being paid uh, to the concept of screen time and digital well-being over the past several years. Uh, indeed, there's a rich body of literature on so-called technological addictions, um, especially empirical work that uses surveys to understand how well people are doing psychologically and socially. Uh, you can see that this has branched off into different types of research and products that aim to help people regulate their use of online platforms. Uh, now, there are two characteristics of this work I just want to briefly mention. So first of all, um, there's this idea of an intrinsic link between digital well-being and time spent online. So on the one hand, existing work is often concerned with trying to predict when people will score highly on a diagnostic survey, um, basically on the time that they spend uh, using technology. So, you know, for example, you might have a survey that scores a certain person a certain number of uh, points for problematicity, and you'll try and see whether they've reached n number of hours in a week of using a platform. Now that's one instance, uh, but the second instance is actually even more fundamental of how time is being used in this research. And that is in some work, uh, it's considered that time is part of the actual kind of fundamental concept of problematic use. Um, this is to the extent that they'll basically validate scales by correlating scale scores with aggregate time spent um, to make sure that they're measuring the right construct. Okay. So time is really important. Uh, now, what's quite interesting about this is that a lot of the existing work, in fact, most of it, is based on self-reported time, basically as part of the survey that people take to diagnose well-being. Um, with the recent availability of trace data, however, uh, a lot of people have started replacing self-reported time with server-side time, uh, which is based on the idea that trace data is more accurate, uh, it's not subject to the human biases that people naturally have, and it's easily uh, obtainable. Now, whether this is actually a good idea in the context of understanding well-being specifically, I think is still quite understudied. Okay, so time is one characteristic. The second characteristic of well-being research is that it's often opaque. So this is for multiple reasons. One of them is that many studies, especially the ones I mentioned using server logs, are conducted on closed platforms. This means that the research is basically inaccessible to anyone who isn't affiliated. So it's very hard to conduct follow-up work or even to just interpret the work in context of the platform and the data that are being used. So, so that is one issue there. A second issue is that there's a bit of controversy around some key results that people say don't have enough analytical robustness. Um, so it's quite important, I think, to have statistical methods that aren't prone to, for example, um, selective results. So this is just some controversy um, around this, and that's why transparency is also a second characteristic of this work that's quite important. So in our research, we're trying to address both of these issues. So firstly, we want to have a better understanding of the role of time in measuring problematic outcomes, particularly when it comes to comparatively measuring self-reports versus uh, behavioral traces. Uh, and secondly, we want to conduct well-being research in a more uh, transparent and open way. Okay, so what do we actually do? Well, we basically focus our work on Lee Chess, which is an online chess platform that has made all of its game data publicly available. Also, it's got kind of natural social incentives for people to play. It's even got a forum, it's got TV functionality, so people interact in many, many ways. Uh, but we're looking specifically at, at the chess games. So we basically extracted the chess time from the clock within the games. And then we also have a second aspect of this research, which is a survey. So the survey has two phases. There's a quiz phase, which uh, asks participants to guess the time that they spend online. And then there's a scale phase, which assesses the problematic effects of using ReChess. Uh, and we modify this and we adapt this based off of recent research on Facebook. To join all these together, we recruited Leashes players from Reddit to complete the survey, and then we linked their answers to their data using their usernames. So we basically have these three components. We have the actual time from the server side, we have perceived time from uh, the survey, and also problematic effects, which are self-reported. I just want to briefly talk about the survey. Basically, the quiz was designed to elicit more granular time measures than you know, other work has done, which usually look only at aggregate metrics, like you know total number of time, total number of hours in the week. And then the problematic use scale is coded so that negative scores reflect worse well-being. 
So three out of five is basically neutral, and we think this is pretty appropriate, given that chess is generally seen as kind of a wholesome intellectual activity. Okay. Um, anyway, so please check out our paper if you want to spend a little more time on these uh, questions. So let's get to the results. Uh, on aggregate, participants scored a mean of around 22 points out of 30 on the scale of questions. And so you can see that this reflects very positive sentiments in general about chess. Um, again, this makes sense because chess is seen as something that's really enriching. Um, but at the same time, 59 people scored under a three on at least one question. So this indicates that Lee Chess had some noticeable non-neutral and potentially negative impacts on some aspect of their lives, right? Be it sleep or kind of social relationships. And to kind of uh, validate this a little bit, we also uh, analyzed some open-ended responses and we found some quite clearly negative outcomes like these. Um, and even this one, and you can see kind of in context of what is being said here, um, this person felt that their relationship was <laughs> kind of ruined by, by uh, overuse of chess. So this kind of echoes um, you know, the Queen's Gambit on Netflix, if you've watched it, there could be potential harms of something even as benign and as innocuous as chess, right? So there seems to be some problems here. But going back to our fundamental question, so what is the relationship between how long you actually played and how long you thought you played and also your scale score. Well, we did this kind of first order comparison of the numerical time measures associated with the scale scores. We found uh, coincidentally that one data derived measure and one self-reported measure of time were respectively the most strongly predictive variables uh, of the scale score, right? Um, so that's already uh, interesting. We got this kind of indication that the two measures are quite important, but Remember that I mentioned that we need to perform a more robust statistical analysis. Well, to do this, we'll use a framework called specification curve analysis, or SEA, and I'll walk you through it. So uh, in our case, what SEA does is it performs a combinatorial search through all possible first order regressions, which I've lined up here on the right. Um, and for each regression, we take the effect size and we plot it on uh, this, this uh, graph on the left here. So each effect size is a gray dot or a red dot. So let's just consider the two most predictive variables uh, and let's make two SEAs, right? So we've got actual total time on the left and self-reported max time on the right. And there are basically 13 other covariates that could be in or out of a first order regression. Um, and those are all basically plotted on the x-axis on each plot. So there are 8,000 of them. Now, quite interestingly, we already see that for self-reported max time, the median effect size is quite clearly larger and more negative than uh, of actual total time. And you'll also see that there's a difference in the slope of the line and also the color of the line. Okay, and I'll walk you through what that means. Okay, so first of all, let's focus on this uh, right hand uh, SCA with self reported next time. The line is really flat and below zero, so it's always below zero. Okay, um, it's always red, so it's always statistically significant. And in fact, it's uh, even outside of a bootstrap confidence interval, which contains around 8 million regressions under the null of no effect. So there is some uh, suggestion here that self-reported time is really important for understanding digital well-being. Okay. Now, what happens when we combine actual and self-reported time? Well, we ran an altered SCA that measures R squared instead of effect size, uh, combining the two measures. And we find that the median R squared is actually double the two previous SCAs, um, which separately analyze these two measures. So this indicates that the measures carry distinct and possibly complementary information about problematic effects because it basically doubles the goodness of fit. Okay, So there is some indication here that the two can be combined. All right. So what do these results really mean for our research questions? Um, what does it mean about time? Well, firstly, we show that self-reported and actual measures of time uh, have this complementary relationship. Um, so, you know, it's quite important to combine them. Um, so consider, for example, if you're trying to build a scale that you want to validate against some sort of uh, aggregate amount of use, you might want to use both server-side time and self-reported time, right? So you maybe you shouldn't just discard self-reports in favor of server-side time if you have that available because there is this complementary relationship. And also, if you're trying to predict problematic use, maybe it's a good idea to combine both self-reports and actual if you have uh, those measures to more effectively build a model. Okay. And finally, I just want to note that a lesson we learned during this process is that by studying these accessible platforms with transparent analytical frameworks, um, we believe that we can conduct research into well-being in a more open and accessible way. Okay. Um, and that concludes our presentation. Thank you so much.